So I've heard it said that a leader is a stark proclaimer of reality. Even though you might be an inspiring leader and you want to say positive things, a real leader is honest and a stark proclaimer of reality. Isn't that good? This happened to me in September, a beautiful September of 2001. I was having a pastoral staff meeting on a beautiful September morning, and all the pastoral staff members were in my study, and we were talking about what we thought was really important, and Lois called, which I thought was odd because she knew I had a pastoral staff meeting and wouldn't normally call, and, and she called through the church secretary and said, interrupt them. And I thought, well, that's odd, you know. And so she said, hey there, you're, I'm watching TV, and an airplane flew into one of the Twin Towers in New York. And I, I thought, okay, well, I'll give you a call back. You know, we'll, we'll see what, what that's about. And in my mind, I was thinking it was just a little, maybe a little private plane that was off course and that it was a minor thing. But Lois realized that it was a very stark, very, you know, like a day none of us would ever forget. And so... I remember that day she took a little black and white television that we had at home and she put it in the car and she just drove to the church. She walked into my study. She said, you need to watch this. You need to see what's going on. And then we all stopped and we thought, that isn't real. That isn't real. It's so bad, it can't be real. It looked like a bad B-grade science fiction movie. But it was real. I feel that way a little bit about the text that we have before us today. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be faithful to God. It wouldn't be faithful to his word not to read this and, 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 look, and look at this like God the Holy Spirit bringing the TV and saying, Look at this. This is reality. And it's reality ahead of time. What we're going to read in Revelation 16 today is something that will literally happen in the future. And maybe soon, God only knows. As sure as Jesus is God and the Bible is the Word of God, then what we're going to read today, as difficult as it is to read, as sad as it is to read, as hard as it is to read, is true. It's reality. And the leaders are stark proclaimers of reality. When I read the text of Revelation 16, you're going to see four things real clearly. Four, four things. You'll observe four things in it. I'll tell you ahead of time so that it will be easy for you to see them. Obviously, We've had these judgments that are being poured out upon the earth, and the symbolism in heaven is that there are seven angels that open seven seals, and when the seals are open, things happen on the earth during this period of time we call the tribulation. And then there are seven trumpets that blow after the seven seals are opened, and when the trumpets blow, judgments happen on the earth. And now there's been a warning about this, but then these final seven judgments are bowl judgments, kind of like saucers that swiftly pour out uh, upon the earth. In other words, uh, in the symbolism is in heaven, there's a, there's a, the angels are given direction to pour out these judgments upon the earth. And all throughout this, you've had multiple warnings. If you've been tracking with us, you know that over and over in the, in the most, in the, in the clearest terms possible, God has not only warned the people about what's happening during this time and how terrible it is, but he's continually given them direction about how not to be, not to have to receive these judgments or how to survive these judgments or how to, how to, if you are killed by these judgments, to go into eternal life. No one has been without a warning. 144,000 young Jewish evangelists, two faithful witnesses, flying angels. Over and over, there have been stark warnings and, and, and a path to deliverance. And what you're going to see today as we read 
in Revelation 16 is now we finally reached the actual description of these seven bowls of judgment that will be poured out. And they come out in staccato fashion. It's swift because it happens right at the coming of Christ, which will be, which will be, we will see in chapter 19. So chapter 15 was, uh, was, uh, if you will, was a, a re, was a, was a preview of what will happen in the future. If you remember last week, 15 talked about these judgments that are going to come out. So it's as if we're watching a you know, serialized television program and they say, here are preview of coming events. Chapter 17 and chapter 18, you're going to notice are like recap of past events. They're going to be descriptions in chapter 17 and descriptions in chapter 18 of what will happen with the great world system called Babylon or the great anti-God world system that has a political piece, has a, has a, has a obviously a political military piece, has an economic piece, and chapter 18 has a religious expression. And God says, I'm going to judge all that in harsh terms that happened before, and it's described in a kind of a recap, in a kind of an echo in 17 and 18. So the chronology, if you're tracking with me, goes from 16, pouring out of the judgments, a little reminder of the, the world system died and was overcome, and then the coming of Christ in chapter 19. Won't it be nice to get to that? The coming of Jesus Christ. That would be like, you can talk back if you want to. You don't have to. I like that. It's March Madness. My goodness, folks. Uh, so feel free to talk back. Won't it be wonderful to get to 19 and the coming of Christ? I just wanted you to get a chance to talk. Isn't it wonderful not to be on the roof today? I mean, it was kind of fun to be on the roof. I got to be honest with you. It was kind of fun, but it is nice and toasty warm in here, and the sun's not in our eyes, and we get to see more of you. So thank the Lord that he's brought us through that, and now we can look at this passage. So let's read this, and let's, let's read it soberly. You're going to notice these things. You're going to notice these seven judgments that are poured out. And you're going to see that, you know, the first one is, the judgment, the bowl judgment is poured out, and there, there are is terrible, painful sores on people. And the second one, the sea, is going to be turned to blood. And the third one, the fresh land, is going to be turned to blood. And the fourth one, the sun is going to scorch people. And the fifth one, the darkness is going to cause men to gnaw their tongues. And the sixth one, there'll be a great demonic, demon-possessed army that sweeps into the Holy Land. And the seventh one, earthquakes and hailstones. It's not it's not pleasant reading. It's like, well, you have to look at it because it's real. So that's what we're going to see. Then we're going to see after that, that along with that, God is justified. The angels are saying, this is right. This is just. I know it's hard to look at, but it's just. God is just. God is holy. God is righteous. We'll talk a little bit about what we sang a lot about today. What does it mean that God is holy? This is a good thing, but but it's, it can be a fierce thing. It can be a frightening thing. It's a sobering thing. It's a serious thing. The holiness of God, very serious. It's good that we see this today because we're stark proclaimers of reality. We'll see that Jesus' righteousness in pouring out justice on the earth is vindicated. So we'll see the seven judgments and we'll, they will hear from the lips of angels and others that Jesus' actions are vindicated. They're righteous. They're right. Then we're going to see another thing. Watch for this that those that are rebels against God will still be rebels against God even when they know these judgments are being poured out by God. They're so arrogant, angry enemies of God, they will still be blaspheming God. You'll see that in in verse uh, 9, verse 11, verse 21. You'll see over and over again, even during these times, the the people that are rebels against God will still be rebels against God. And there's a fourth thing that you want to watch for. There are some red letters in this, if you will. There's some direct statements from Jesus, if you will. And it's a blessing in the middle of all this is a blessing from the lips of Jesus. And he's telling us the way of escape. There's a way to escape the judgments, the righteous judgments of God that are going to be poured out in the future. This is reality. This is reality. This is these things, though they're spiritual, though they're future, they're real. And, and if you want to orient your life, you want to orient your life, what you do, what you prioritize, how you spend your money, how you spend your time, what you believe in around what's real, what's really going to happen. So when now we get to see this. So we read this from God's Word, Revelation 16. Then I heard a loud voice 
from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful, painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out a bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard an angel in charge of the waters, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, and for you, you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink it is what they deserve. And I heard, an, I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Powerful statement of the justification of God's justice. Verse 8, fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch the people with fire. And they were, were scorched by the fierce seed, and they cursed the name of God, and who had the power over these plagues. And they didn't repent and give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness, and people gnawed their tongues in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water dried up, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they were demonic spirits performing signs who go around to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of the Almighty. And now the narrative is interrupted by a benedict, a, 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 a a blessing from Jesus. Red letters, right? Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. This is spiritual language. We'll describe it. But I think you know, if you're a Christian and you're familiar with your Bible, you, you kind of get the idea of what he's referring to. We'll be very specific later. But, 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 but in the middle of all this horrifying description is Jesus speaking with warmth and with love and with a desire to bless people. He desires to bless you and your family right now. He want, he's reserved his very best for you if you humble yourself and under his authority. Bless, behold, I'm coming like a thief, and blessed, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeps his garments on. Verse 16, and they, they assembled them at the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Now the seventh bowl, verse 17, poured out his bowl into the angel, I'm sorry, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a great earthquake such as there never has never been since man was on earth. So great was that earthquake. By the way, I just want to interrupt because I think it's important. There are different views of Revelation. We acknowledge this. Some, a small group of people, kind of see all that was described here in all these stark terms is really just kind of hyperbole describing things that were bad that happened in Christian history. And for that reason, I, I reject that altogether when I read something like this, when it says, such as there never has been since man was on earth, so great was the earthquake. There's the, 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 the superlatives are too great for this to have been, that, that eliminates the preterist view, if, if you know what I'm saying. That everything here is describing the fall of Jerusalem. And set, no, no, what's happening here is they're describing something that's never happened before. And the language throughout Revelation is like this. It's describing things that have never happened before. That's, that's a, an example of that. So uh, this great earthquake, I'm in verse 18, such as never been since man was on earth. So great was that earthquake. And the great city was split in three parts. The cities of the nations fell. God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones about a hundred pounds each fell from the earth on people and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So again, the, the events of 16 are just before the coming of Christ described in 19. What we just read happens right at the coming of Christ in 19, but you have before that in 15, you have 
a bit looking forward, and then 17 and 18, you have a bit looking backward. So it's not strictly chronological, and you might ask the question, well, how can you tell where this belongs? Very simply, you read the material, and you match it up with what happened in the historic description, and you understand where it fits in the chronology of things, because it, it lays directly over what happened. You can tell it's the same thing. Does that make sense? So essentially what you have here is this is going to happen next. These judgments are going to happen. These judgments are going to happen. These judgments are going to happen. Jesus is going to return. All along, he's doing supernatural things to plead for people to soften their hard hearts and to repent. And any time they do, they can be drawn into God's kingdom forever and God's peace forever. So let's look at these seven bowls. We've already gone over them, but the first bowl is sores on those who worship the beast. The natural order of the planet, as we know, is in upheaval. Those who accept the mark of the beast find the beast can't protect them from the wrath of God. They've chosen the wrong side. By the way, this is happening all around us even today. Then in verse 3, you have the sea turning to blood. And there are a lot of descriptions, you know, in, in natural history about, the, about possible natural things like this. This is obviously a supernatural thing that has natural consequences on the earth. It, it's, the best way to see these, I think, is rather than trying to decode every little minor thing, take a step back and just look and say, is this good or bad? Well, like, it's bad. Bad, bad, whatever it is, really bad. Um, and it's, it's, God, it's an expression of God's righteous, settled wrath. Not, he's lost his cool. God doesn't lose his temper. God has, only has righteous anger against, against sin. Just as if maybe a loved one of yours was horribly hurt. If you had any character at all, you would have a hatred for that act because that's righteousness, righteous indignation, if you will. So the second bowl in verse 3, the sea turns to blood. And there's an angel in, in charge of the waters. Um, the third angel pours out a bowl in the rivers and the springs of water turn to blood. So you have the so, so painful, harmful sores on people and, and pain. And then you have the sea turning to blood and things dying within the sea and the, and the fresh water turning to blood. And then as if you all recoil in horror, the angel says, just are you holy one who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. They have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. I heard of the altar saying, yes, Lord, God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The Bible is very clear. This isn't arbitrary. This isn't God sinning. God forbid. This is God's righteous indignation on sinners. Then verses 8 and 9 talk about the scorching heat from the sun. They blaspheme God then instead of repenting. And this is the first mention of that in verse 9. They curse the name of God. They did not repent and give him glory. This is a stubbornness of rebellion. They, they know that they're being rebellious against God, stubborn against God. You, can, can I say this to you in love? You're here in church, so it's probably you're seeking God. But, but if you're not, if you don't, don't know the Lord, sin leads to sin and stubbornness leads to more stubbornness and that will come to the end for people who turn away from God. They will just blaspheme God to his face before he sends them to hell. Almost like they won't have any inclination to just yield to God. You know, if, if you're sitting here today, I, I would just suggest that what you say in your heart to God is, God, I want to be humble and tender before you. I want to do whatever you say, believe whatever you teach, follow you wherever you lead me. I never want to be a rebel against God, but I want to be humble and tenderhearted to God. I just tell him that. I tell him that every day. Wherever you find a pocket of rebellion in your own heart, wherever you find a, a stubborn sin that you're trying to overcome, humble yourself before God. This is a holy God we're talking about. He does not sin. He cannot tolerate any sin. This is the message of the entire New Old Testament. And contrary to popular opinion, it's the clear teaching of the New Testament, clear to the end of the New Testament. God is holy. And his holiness is a part of his beauty, but he cannot tolerate sin. So we're all in bad, we're all in bad shape. <laughs> but let's, 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 hurry, let's hurry on so we can get to the good news. So this darkness and pain in verses 10 and 11, in verses 12 through 16, there's a war. He drives up the Euphrates. There's a demon-possessed armies. They flood in, and this war, it begins. 
It's not really clear who the war is against. This is in the, it, it, it's in the Valley of Armageddon. This is the great final war. And Jesus comes back and ends this, but it doesn't say that yet because we're not to 19. The earth is shaken and there's still blaspheming God. You see it again in verse, you see it in verse 9, you see it in 11. They curse God, the God of heaven, for their pain and sorrow. They did not repent of their deeds. And then at the very end, you see it again. It's how the chapter ends. They, uh, they cursed God for the plague of the hail. So the seventh bowl is the earthquake and the hail and the shaking earth and the blaspheming God. This is a horrifying in its intensity and scope. If you thought the Twin Towers and the attack on, on the Pentagon, as horrible as it was and as blood, bloody as it was, if you thought that was bad, and you remember how just that, those few things brought the whole, na- changed the whole, changed the nation as we know it. Changed everything about everything we do in just a handful of attacks like that. Imagine something on this scale happening on the earth and the, and what would happen that's just the reality this is what the bible says if you you know you have you figured out in the last year you can't get a confident report of reality from the evening news if you think you are i feel so bad for you you know you just i, I won't be mean it's church and all but you know you're kind of dumb you're a lemming if you really really think they're telling you the truth that they're not selling all the time, they're not pitching something, they're not, the, the, are you like I am? Who's going to tell me the truth? How do I know how to raise my kids? How to influence my grandkids? How can I prepare my grandchildren for the world they're going to live in? What's it going to look like? God says, I have a book about that. Trust that book. Believe that book. Follow that book. I will empower you to do it. We, this as Christians is something we have. A sure and certain hope. In what God has said, we can build our lives on this. That's why, do you understand, Revelation wasn't written to scare the bejabbers out of you, although if it works, that's good. Revelation was written to encourage people that were being oppressed. The original audience were under religious oppression, and God wants them to see, yes, it's bad, but God, Jesus is going to come and conquer in the end, and you can be on his side. That's the message. That's an encouraging message. But it's pretty sober, and leaders are stark proclaimers of reality. And so we have this. Now, second thing, who is, so we would say, that what's going to happen in the future? Well, these judgments are going to pour out. What does this teach us about God? I'm going to say a couple of things. Who is God, and who am I, and what should we do? Okay, who is God? According to, according to this, notice these things in chapter 15 and 16, what they reveal about God. I've already, we've sung about this. I've already referred to this. What does it mean God is holy? Well, one of the things it means is beautiful, other, perfect, perfectly holy, never sinned, and cannot tolerate sin. And, 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 and this is good. And so, now, these are things about, let me say some things about God. I'll go over them quickly and then a little more slowly. He's the king of the universe. He's just. He's holy. He's wrathful against sin. And these are things I want to show you. He's the king of the universe. Look in chapter 15 and verse 3. And they sang the song of Moses, remember this last week, the servant of God, and the song of the land saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the almighty, just and true are your ways, O king of the nations. Somebody told me this week, nice, I talked to a nice young man, I really liked him a lot. And I said, are you a Christian? Because he was like talking about spiritual stuff. I said, are you a Christian? He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I believe in all, all ways, lots of ways to God. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I'm curious about something. If Jesus Christ, so if Jesus is one of the ways to God, yeah. So if Jesus were to walk in the room today and he were to say to you, hey, Jacob, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What would you tell him? That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's what he's saying. Who's the, who's the God of, of America? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Who's the God of every nation on earth and every people that ever live? Jesus is the king. That's what the Bible says, and we'll know it one day. He's also just, in case you wonder. He's just. Look at chapter 15 again and and verse 3. And Notice this. Just and true are your ways, O king of the nations. Just and true. One of the beauties of God is his justice. One of the glories of God is his perfect justice. And he has an amazing way to both love people and show mercy and 
have perfect justice. We'll get to that. And then he's holy. Chapter 15 and verse 4. Who, shall, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. And, 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 and by the way, his justice is mentioned in chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. If I miss something, the notes are online. And then his, he's holy. Chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. I looked in the sanctuary in the tent of witness, and the heaven was open out of the holy of holies. Out of the sanctuary came the seven angels, the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen with gold sashes. All those symbolism is, this is a, right, a judgment that's coming from God, and he's, he's righteous. He, he's just. He's holy. And so this is what the scriptures say about God. And, and he's holy. His judgment emerges from his holiness. And he is, and so as a result of that, he, for him to be God, and be just, he must have a perfect hatred against sin. If I can say it this way, the sin that hurts you and your loved ones, but even more importantly, the sin that, dam that, the sin that would attack God, though never damage him. So he is wrathful against that sin, and he wouldn't be holy, he wouldn't be righteous, he wouldn't be good if he didn't hate sin. And his character is strong, determined, unrelenting opposition against all that's holy, unholy and unjust. Now, let me give you, real quickly, just some New Testament Bible on this so that you don't get pulled into the false idea that Jesus is kind of an aging, hippie, toothless, chill, you know, everything's okay with him let's smoke weed, you know, something like that. that. That's not true about Jesus. That's the Jesus of popular culture. It's like whatever you want him to be. He's Republican if you're Republican. He's Democrat if you're Democrat, right? That's the Jesus of America. Jesus is the Jesus of the Bible. Just sharing with you, not the Jesus of the Bible. Just read the Bible. Here, okay, you want to hear about the Jesus of the Bible? Let me just read a few things. This is 2 Corinthians. I, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians says, The Lord Jesus has been revealed from heaven in the future with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his might. Did I just quote the Old Testament or the New Testament? It's the New Testament. This is Jesus of the Bible. Listen to 2 Peter. It's it's both wonderful and frightening. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, when the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements, the heavenly bodies, will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are going to be dissolved, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness, godliness, waiting for, hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. Can you see it's like bad and good at the same time? God is going to burn the curse out of this earth. Jesus is going to come back in flaming vengeance, taking fire, taking vengeance against the unrighteous who have stubbornly resisted him with the angels with him. And this will be a frightening specter, but he'll bring a new heaven and a new earth and will be populated with all those who are on his side, those who believe in his son, Jesus. You, you, you can write it differently, but it won't be reality. This is the Bible, right? And, the, and that's why it says it's a fearful thing in Hebrews, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And that's why the Bible says, even in Romans, this beautiful treatise of Romans that so tells us about the grace of God. It begins like this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. So who is God? He's holy and he's just and he's, he's right in his wrath. And then who am I? I'm out apart from God. Who, who are you? Can I say it that way? Who are you apart from God? Apart from a right relationship with Jesus, you are an enemy with God, and so am I. And so, so the Bible says in 16, 2, these are, the first angel went, poured out his bowl on the earth, harmful, painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. It'll come to the point where you, you, don't, you, you won't have a neutrality. It'll either be the mark of the beast or loyalty to Jesus. And, and, and so um, without Christ, we're, we're, apart from God, we're enemies of, of God. We're guilty, according to chapter According to the whole Bible, people say, well, I, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't sinned. Like, I know people that have sinned worse than me. That's the wrong standard of comparison. You want to compare yourself to a holy God because you're going to be judged by a holy God. You're not going to be judged on the curb someday. You, you know, in other words, if there's judgment, if you go before the white throne, 
a judgment of God, God doesn't say, well, you're better than that guy. He says, according to God's holiness, are you as holy as God? Now, stay with me, because there's good news coming, but you got for the good news to be good, you got to hear the bad news in a heavy way first. You see that? And, that? and the Bible says that I'm resistant to God. I'm a rebel, and I think I already made this point, chapter, chapter 16, verses 9, 11, and 21. Talk about the natural state of us. We're, we're like, I will do, I want to run my life. I'm not going to have somebody tell me how to run my life. I'm not going to have God tell me how to run I'm not going to have the Bible tell me how to run my life. I will run my life. Okay, that's, that's the path to hell. All, only people who survive this life and go to heaven are ones who humble themselves and says, Jesus, you can run my life. They're the only ones. Others are rebels at heart, passive, but still rebellious. Uh, and, then, and then finally, an idolater at heart, you know, worshiping something. You're going to worship something. You're going to worship something else than God. Now, now what, is, what is my hope? Remember we said there are four things here. There are the seven judgments. There's who God is, he's holy. There's who we are, pretty bad shape, guilty before God. Is there anything else in this passage? There's a hint about something that's really clear other places in the Bible. It's that make sure you're awake and you have your garment on. It's kind of a shadowy, poetic hint, but you get it, right? You know that it's referring to being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Can I be really plain with you? All of us are sinners and deserve to be separated from God forever in hell. Good people, sinners, bad people, sinners. Sin a little bit, sin a lot. It's enough sin. The Bible, right? When Jesus taught about this, he said, if you commit adultery in your heart, you've sinned enough to go to hell. If you're angry and you call people names, you've sinned enough to go to hell. If you take something that isn't yours, you've sinned enough to go to hell. It's like, oh no, that's bad news. The, the good news is there's, you can be clothed in the righteousness of Christ by repenting of your sin, acknowledging that, and believing in Jesus. And that's what this is saying. By the way, that's what 15 is alluding to. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Oh, one last warning. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments on so that he won't be naked and exposed. This, it's like Jesus can't just pour out wrath without just like one little, one more little mention of mercy. I so want to bless you. And if, if you're here today and you're unsure about that, please schedule a personal conversation. If you're a lady, we have ladies here that love to sit down, walk you through this. You're a man, let me do it. One of our elders, number of our men, lots of our men right here. Um, how many of you that are men in our church would love to sit down with somebody and explain the gospel to them? Raise your hand and leave it up just for a minute. Okay, look around, bro. Look at those guys. Like, get, talk with any of them. Just say, hey, talk to me about the gospel. That's sweet. That's sweet, isn't it? That's what we need to do, church. There's a real heaven. There's a way to be with God forever. There's a real hell where people will suffer away from the presence of God forever. And we have the answer, the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to repent and be saved. So we never want to stop. We never want to give up. We never want to let our foot off the gas. We never want to stop being creative. We never want to stop being passionate because we have the only hope of the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what this, this passage is teaching. And so we want to turn from all unrighteousness, of course, and repent and admit and acknowledge all unrighteousness. We also want to, and this is a tricky one, be careful that you also acknowledge the, the self-righteousness that is another kind of unrighteousness. I, I don't see a ton of that here, but it's everywhere. You heard about the lady that would walk up to you at church. This lady doesn't go to our church. She would say, did you see this movie? Let's well, talk about a movie that was on. Yeah, have you seen that movie? And then the people would say, yeah, you know, I don't know. She said, what'd you think of it? And then they'd say to her, what'd you think of it? She goes, I don't believe it's right for Christians to go to movies. And, you know, you kind of want to tell people like that, you are, you are aware that self-righteousness is a kind of unrighteousness, aren't you? But some of us are, 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 maybe you're not right with God yet, but you could be like today. You line up with God. You hear about the guy that God was walking through a cemetery and he noticed that all the graves were a certain way and one was crosswise. He's like, what in the world? And they go, oh yeah, you know about that guy, right? He was crosswise his entire life. He was against everything, and he was against everybody. Anytime anybody had an idea, he had a different idea. So when we buried him, we just decided, why bury him like everybody else? Let's bury him crosswise. 
because he lived crosswise, he died crosswise, and we buried him crosswise. You're laughing because you know somebody like that. If you're not laughing, maybe that's you. I'm just saying. But you want to get lined up with Jesus. Just say, yes, sir, you're the king. This is that simple. I, I'm not sure I understand everything, God. I'm not sure I understand everything that preacher just said. I'm not sure. It, it, it makes me scared sometimes when I read the Bible. I don't know what to think. But line up with Jesus. Or believe, repent. And if you're a believer and there's something a little crooked in your life, hey, line that up too. Make it right. He will help you. He will, by the power of his Holy Spirit, help you to walk in, in holiness in life and live, and live a righteous life. So see God as he is. See the future as it is. See the past as it is. See your sin as it is. See yourself as you are. Be a stark proclaimer of reality to yourself. And then say to Jesus, say, what, I'm with you. I'm on your side. He says, I'm on, I'm on your side. And, and let's prioritize, you know, the gospel. I have, I have some ideas. I got a minute or two, and then we're going to sing a song before we, before we, we, but let me tell you a little, a couple of things, a little, my heart about this, and then, and then a story that I think might be encouraging to you. I have uh, some ideas in my brain that, you know, if you've been around the ministry a long time, when you have a good idea, you know, that is a good idea. I will share it with you. I have a good idea, a good idea that will reach people for Christ, and you can be involved in it. You, do you realize you, you could, if you wanted to, you could have a sermon-based Bible study, or you could talk with somebody about the Bible. You could say, hey, let's, um, pastor's going to be preaching on Revelation 17. Let's get together ahead of time. Let's talk about Revelation 17, ask questions, and then let's get together afterward and talk about it. You, you, you could do that. You could invite people that didn't know the Lord. You could strike up a conversation with somebody who, who's, who's far from God or, or confused. You could go just love on somebody who's hurting. Because, I mean, shouldn't there be an urgency about this? Are you reading the same Bible I'm reading? There should be an urgency about this. There should be a passion about this. This is serious. I heard this. I heard there was a, a religious order that built, uh, that built a, a hotel, a, 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 an inn, an inn in a pass in, in the mountains, in the, in the Alps, in just near the border of Italy and Switzerland. And there's a very, very dangerous pass high up in these mountains that travelers had to go through, and they had to go through the snow and the, and the cold. It was St. Bernard's Pass, they called it. And so they built this in there so that if people came, they could stop halfway and they'd be safe. But people frequently got trapped in the snow, even in an avalanche. And they trained a breed of dogs. You course, have heard of St. Bernard's. And the legend about St. Bernard's is, this is probably a person who really liked brandy who made this up, that they would have a cask of brandy around their neck. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but it sure makes a good story. And they would send these dogs out when people were trapped in, a, in, a, in an avalanche, and sometimes in twos, and one dog would lie on the person and warm their body and save their life, and the other dog would run back for help. There was a man in prison, and he was a rebel. He was a hardened criminal in prison. True story, read it this week. And he was uh, in, in a part of the Aryan nation. It's a bad dude. And he was with a group of other people that were plotting some very bad things. So they put him in solitary confinement. And it made him angry and bitter. And they planned on never getting out of there. But somebody, a woman in New Jersey decided that she would write him a letter and tell him about Jesus. So she would write letters to him and he would just look at him and throw them away. And then once uh, she, she started sending books, Christian books. You can't do this, I don't think, in prisons anymore, but at the time you could. She sent him Christian books and he would read the letters because they were interesting. He would throw the books away. One day he wrote her back and he said, I don't trust people. I don't trust any people. People will turn on you. He said, I trust animals, but I don't trust people. So she wisely sent him another letter with no book, a tract about a dog, a story about a St. Bernard. And this is the legend that one day out in the mountains, a man got lost and disoriented in the cold. And he was so disoriented, he didn't know where he was or who he was. But a dog found him and, and went to lay on him. When he woke up, he was so frightened, he took a dagger out and he stabbed that, the dog. And the dog bled but went back to his master and left a trail of blood. He died, but the man was saved. And when this prisoner read that, his heart melted and he came to Christ. He's still living for the Lord today. We are the ones that get to tell people Jesus left a trail of blood to God. Straight to the heart of God for you. 
and you can be free of the penalty of your sin and all the sadness of that. You can be right with God. You can be with him forever in heaven. How wonderful is that? We, we sing a song, the wrath of God was satisfied in Christ alone. Remember singing this? It's a gospel song. We're going to sing it now. But in it, it says the wrath of God was satisfied. Let's stand together as we close our service today by singing this beautiful song, which includes the gospel.